Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see everybody's face. So we want to thank you for being here today. I'm Sharon Smith. I'm the Director of Professional Development and Education here at the University of Michigan Health System, Michigan Medicine. So um, we want to welcome all of you who are physically here today, but we also have six off-sites that are live streaming this presentation, so know you are part of a larger audience across the health system. Uh, Brighton Health Center is in, the School of Nursing is in, Northville, West Ann Arbor, so many people are joining us from across um, really our whole outreach area. So I just want to tell you a little bit about um, our CE today. So a couple of points. Number one, if you've not signed in, even if you're not a nurse, please sign in. Two, your sign in will get you the evaluation that you need that will spit out your CEU at the end of evaluation. So please make sure that you're signed in. And really everything you need to know, you have to stay for the full hour to get your content. That's really an honor system rule. And um, I think that's about it. So we're gonna get on with the presentation. Any questions, I will be here afterwards about CE. So I think really now we just wanna take a deep breath. And I think from every regard, this lectureship is really in honor of Marge and the incredible years of service that she gave to us. And we'll talk about that in a bit, but sit back and listen because Dr. Strecker has incredible words to share with us as nurses. So we are recognizing Dr. Calarco's 17 years of leadership. And um, we really thank her for her dedication to leadership. I was just talking with Dr. Strecker and about her sense of building a community here. And I think that is Marge's um, lasting legacy for us is that we refer to ourselves as a community. And that's an incredible legacy above all else. So when Marge retired, a lectureship, an endowed lectureship was established in her name. And um, it's co-sponsored by the School of Nursing with Michigan Medicine. And the aim is really to focus the lecture on leadership principles. That was Marge's driving purpose when she was here with us. And she's really spent her entire career studying and promoting leadership at every opportunity. Um, she is a scholar in leadership. She is a role model for leadership. And so when the leadership team got together for this event, we said there really is no other person for this first lecture besides Dr. Vic Strucker. So the other connection that you need to know about is that Marge spent years working with positive organizational scholarship of which Dr. Strecker is a huge proponent of, we'll talk about. So they are inextricably linked in their leadership styles, purpose, and vision. So um, I'd like to now introduce the um, Dean of our School of Nursing, and she is going to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Patty Hearn is both the Dean and a professor um, at the School of Nursing, uh, molecular and cellular um, and developmental biology. So an incredible scientist, internationally known for her work in understanding those concepts. She's joined the School of Nursing in 2016. So we've had the honor of her being here for about four years. She came from the University of Texas where she was Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation and an Executive Officer within the university. So she joins us straight from the School of Nursing. For all of you who might not know, it's um, alumni week and weekend. And um, so we just wanna thank Dean Hearn for being here with us today and for really supporting this entire effort. So welcome Dean Hearn. Thank you, Sharon, and hello to everyone. Welcome. It is really an honor for the School of Nursing to be partnering with Michigan Medicine to host and to move forward with this important and really very treasured inaugural lectureship. I'd like to thank Colleen Zimmerman, Sharon, and many people who worked very hard to organize this and who made the brilliant decision to invite Dr. Strecker. Let me tell you a little bit about him, um, and then I think we'll, we'll move right to his remarks because that's what we're here to hear about. 
Um, he's a behavioral scientist and a professor at the School of Public Health. And as many of you know, public health has always been an ally of nursing for many, many years. We share a lot of concepts. We share a belief in what we can do for patients. We share that frontline engagement. Um, I first knew about him actually because of his research studies looking at developing and maintaining a strong purpose in life. And I think we encounter that not only in our own lives, but in our patients and their families as they have to look at that as they encounter illness and healing in our health. So in 1995, Vic uh, founded the UM Center for Health Communications Research. And I want to tell you about this because I, I don't know if he'll go deeply into it, but he's almost like a brand name in innovation and entrepreneurship for his ability to develop companies and be able to move them into the marketplace, into the communities that really can use them well. In 1998, he founded Health Media, a digital health coaching company that then was subsequently sold to Johnson & Johnson, which, as you might imagine, is a real sign of success. In 2015, he founded Kumanu, a digital health solution company that integrates the science of health and well-being, smartphones, might be a little bit of an oxymoron, but smartphones, and big data analytics. He's an author of several books, which I shall shamelessly promote, because I think you should rush out and get them all. His most recent is Life on Purpose, How Living for What Matters Most Changes Everything. Please help me welcome Dr. Strecker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Hoon. Uh, it is a true, true honor. Uh, being here to uh, deeply thank Marge. So thank you so much. You are a lovely person and uh, have helped this university overall. You are a true Go Blue person. Uh, you have really connected. We, we can thank you personally, my family, my wife who is here. Jerry is somewhere there, I don't know where, but um, she's here. Both, oh, there, nice. <laughs> so, so Jerry and I both thank you from the bottom of our heart for our, everything you've done to integrate uh, nursing services, nursing care for this hospital system. Thank you very much. And and besides putting your hands together, I'm gonna ask, does anyone have a smartphone in here? Anybody? <laughs> Would you mind taking that smartphone out for a second? This is going to be a little work for you. Okay. If you have a smartphone, if you don't mind taking it out. By the way, what's on the wallpaper of your smartphone? Anyone have their spouse on it? How about their kids? Anyone raise your hand? Nice. Who has their dog? Oh, that's good. How about their cat? So we have some cat people here, I see. Okay, <laughs> fine. That'll be okay, I guess. Um, any works of nature? Okay, good. Any beautiful artwork? Okay, so we're going to talk about what matters most to people, the why, and very often you put that right on the face of your smartphone. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you don't mind going to the text app in your smartphone, and I would love to have you put in one word that describes March. And you can do that by just texting in 37607 and then putting in Strecker, and that's S-T-R-E-C-H-E-R. -E Let's see if this works. May not. So 37607 is the address, and then put in Strecker, and you'll be joining a, a survey then, a poll, called Poll Everywhere. You getting the survey? Not getting the survey? Any success? Oh, good, okay. Got something going here. There we go. Whoa, here we are, nice. Love that. Brave, valued, insightful. Oh, okay. The words are bigger if more people put it in. This is you, Marge. Oh, awesome. This is great. 
I think people from different sites can do this as well. We'll try it. If you're from a different site, don't be shy. Tell us what word best describes Marge. Oh, this is beautiful. Nice. Strength. Transformational. Nice. I like the nice. You can put emojis in it, too, if you want. <laughs> wow, somebody put fierce. Woo. Tough. Integrity. Wow, inspiring. Nice. Oh, this is... Oh, all right. Yay. <laughs> I'm loving this. Yeah. Oh. Oh, this is so cool. Wow. So today we're here to examine um, what it's like to be purposeful. And I'm going to move forward. You can keep putting them in if you want. It'll grow, and we'll save it. We'll send it out to folks, okay? But, but you know, over 2,000 years ago, in fact, about 2,400 years ago, Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Now, Socrates was essentially a street philosopher. So imagine Socrates right next to, like, the Michigan Theater. He's on Liberty, and he's by that alley. You know where that alley is, okay? And maybe there's a group of people hanging out with him. And he's kind of spouting off, and, you know, you might, if, if you walk by a person like that, you might, like, go to the other side of the street, or you'd just take a beeline around that person, because you may not want to interact all that much. But, you know, one of those disciples happened to be Plato. Plato in this David painting is on the left there. So um, he had some pretty smart students. And I love this idea that the unexamined life is not worth living. And actually, I'm hoping over the next hour, you might actually want to think about examining your, your own life. It's up to you, but I think that might be interesting. But that's one side of the coin, examining your life. And then, you know, of course, Plato was Socrates' student. Do you, anyone know who the most famous student of Plato's was? Ooh, who said that? Raise your hand. Well done, Steve. Well done. And in fact, Aristotle who was the student of Plato, who was the student of Socrates, said, well, that's fine, Socrates, but, you know, a purposeless life isn't worth examining in the first place. So think about the two sides of that interesting coin. We want to examine our lives, but at the same time, we want to examine a life that has purpose in it, and we want to become more purposeful through that examination. So you might be asking yourself, what does Vic mean by purpose in the first place? What are we talking about? I want to simplify this down for everyone. Basically, Having a purpose means you have a goal or set of goals around the things that matter most in your life. That's all we're talking about, okay? So we'll be thinking today about the things that matter most in our lives, the things that matter most in our work, the things that matter most in, at home. Those things are the core of our purpose, and we set goals around that. If I'd ask everybody here, hold your breath, can you hold your breath as long as you can? I'm not going to do that, by the way. But if we did, maybe, I, I have no idea. Who can hold their breath more than a minute? Oh, come on. Really? All right, fine. So let's say the average is 30 seconds. 30 seconds we're holding our breath. But if I put a clock up here and said, okay, let's see if we can do it for a whole minute, you wouldn't on average hold it a minute, but you'd hold it about 15 seconds longer. Why? Because you've just set a goal. The goal can be as small as a checklist at, on a Saturday morning, tomorrow morning. You might have a checklist of different things, you know, to-do list, right? Isn't it nice when you cross something off or you check a box because you've just met that goal? And we know we'll get more done if we set a goal. A purpose is the biggest goal you could possibly set because it's around the things that matter most in your life. So let's start off with a little study. Let's start off with a study because there are a lot of nursing students in here, right? Any nursing students? Raise your hand. Awesome. Okay, we'll be talking a lot about you guys. So let's start with a research study here. This research study took college students, and in one group they gave them, they randomized, just like any randomized drug trial, they randomized people into three different groups, and one group they gave them a backpack, and the backpack had 25 pounds of dead weight in it. In fact, they said, you have 25 pounds of dead weight, like dumbbells in the back, in this backpack, 25 pounds. The second group, they said, you have a backpack that's really, really important. It's 25 pounds of incredibly important scientific equipment. It wasn't, by the way. It was 25 pounds of dead weight. But here's what they did in that. They literally put a little fan, an electric motor inside, just a fan to word, to make it sound as if there's important scientific equipment inside. So I know, really, they lied to him totally. So they said, here is this 
you know, important backpack you're carrying, 25 pounds of important scientific equipment, not just important to this study, but important to science. This is really important stuff that you're doing. And then the third group was a control group. So we have three groups, right? Got a group, I have a purpose and a heavy backpack. This group, I have no purpose and a heavy backpack. <laughs> then I'm in a control group. Now here's what they do. They blindfold them, isn't that nice? So they blindfold them and then they put them on a slope, 14.5 degrees. Don't ask me why it's 14.5, but a lot of studies have done this in psychology to look at what? They're looking at resilience. They want to find out when you're blindfolded, how steep do you perceive this slope to be? Isn't that an interesting study? Like, do you perceive your life being really hard? Or do you perceive your life being easier? Do you perceive the slope as a mountain or is it something as a path that you can walk on? So 14.5 degrees, many, many studies doing this in the past. Control conditions typically double the slope size in their estimation, even after training, okay? So sure enough, 14.5 degrees, the control condition carrying no backpack estimated to be 31 degrees. Okay. Now, what do you think the backpack of no purpose produced? What do you think they estimated on average? Higher, lower? Yeah, higher by a lot, in fact. 42 degrees they estimated the slope to be, okay? Because they're carrying a heavy backpack. That would make some sense. Now, how about the purposeful backpack? Remember the first control condition? What was it? 31 degrees, right? What did this purposeful backpack, same weight as this group is? 31 degrees. Exactly what the control condition said. In other words, if you feel that you have purpose, then the slope gets less steep. Is that making sense? I mean, whenever you're doing something super purposeful, whether it's like helping a patient in something very important, or you're dancing at a wedding, suddenly all of the pain goes away. Suddenly you're joyous. Suddenly you're focused, right? It's like you're purposeful, and that's awesome. So there are many studies of this, but I just love the title of this, Leveling Mountains. Purpose attenuates links between perceptions of effort and steepness. Now, by the way, I'm, gonna, I'm looking through this audience, and I can't see the audiences that are connected here through satellite, but I do know that every single person in this room has had a mountain that they've had to climb. There's nobody. Anyone in here never had any problems? <laughs> I want to meet them, but... Um, all of us have had problems. All of us have had mountains that we've had to go through. And if it's all right, I'd like to describe a mountain that I had to go through. Um, and I'm going to read just the first page and a quarter of my book, if it's okay, that describes this mountain that I went through. Is that okay? All right. Good. Thank you. Put my glasses on because I'm old. Okay. June 20th, 2010. 5.15 a.m. in my kayak a few miles from shore, paddling hard. Lake Michigan smooth and ice cold, my kayak cutting through a thick, silky curtain of water off the bow. Still in boxers and t-shirt, hadn't thought about dressing for the chilly morning air. Wasn't really thinking. I'd been woken by a dream, climbed out of bed, and a minute later pushed off into the lake. Not very smart. Lake Michigan owns hundreds of ships and certainly its share of puny kayaks. I didn't really care. Maybe I'll paddle to Wisconsin, I thought. But the sun stopped my paddling as it broke over the horizon. I turned toward the east and sat still, perfectly quiet. Suddenly, a billion gold flecks of light surrounded me as the sun rose. In that moment, I felt the warmth and love of my daughter, Julia. Get over it, Dad, she was telling me. I almost tipped over. It was startling to hear her voice. He had died just a few months before. Crossroad of my life was right there, two miles off the shore of Lake Michigan. The signs were clear. One arrow said change everything, and the other said death. And Julia wasn't derisively telling me to get over it. She was telling me that if I was to survive, I'd need to get over myself and live for what matters most. When I came back to shore, I realized that it was Father's Day. This is her gift to me the gift that would save my life. So my daughter was born, our daughter was born in 1990 
a 10 out of 10, she used to like to say. That was great. So she was born healthy. And then our family went to Maastricht, Netherlands, to do a research sabbatical. And our daughter started losing weight. And in fact, it turns out she had caught a chickenpox virus that attacked her heart and created a cardiomyopathy. And that happens, thank goodness, to very, very, very few kids. But it happened to her. And the doctor there told us that she would be dead within one month and to go home. So the next morning, we flew home. We went back to the University of North Carolina, and they said, you know what, maybe, maybe she would be eligible for a heart transplant. And of course, this is like shocking news. You know, everything is shocking for during that period of time. But we decided to list her because we thought, well, you know, even though we could do the research and, you know, we knew that half the kids waiting for a heart died before they got one. We knew that half the kids within the first five years of getting a heart died. This is back in 1990. I think that's changed a little bit now. So we knew that our chance of living to be five was only 25%, roughly. So we had to ask ourselves, is it worth listing her? Should we list her for a heart transplant? And we thought, if she could have a big life, whatever that means, a big life, then it's worth listing her. And so we ended up listing her, and she ended up being the first child in the southeastern part of the United States to get a heart transplant. And we decided that we would live every day as if that day might be her last day. And I'm not talking about a make-a-wish kind of life. And I love the Make-A-Wish Foundation, but it wasn't like I want her to go to Disney World and meet Cameron Diaz and you know whoever every single day. You can't do that in your life, but maybe just have a bigger life, as big a life as we could imagine with her. And sure enough, she had an incredibly big life. And you might have noticed this little piece down here that says UMSN. You know what that is? She ended up applying and getting accepted into the University of Michigan School of Nursing. She wanted to be a nurse. She ended up needing a second heart transplant when she was nine. And we are here at the University of Michigan. She went to Mott. And one evening, she ended up having six heart attacks, cardiac arrests. And nurses and respiratory, a respiratory therapists and doctors worked with her for over four hours to keep her alive. And there's a whole story behind that that we don't have time to go into. But that changed her life. I mean, she, she had a do not resuscitate sign on. She came back miraculously. And she decided, I want to become a nurse. Because the people who took care of me the most were the nurses. The people who I connected with were the nurses. So, and I want to thank Marge for having amazing nursing here at Mott, who really saved her life and brought her back. But when she died when she was 19 years old, I went through my own grief, of course. And one of the best things many of you have or will deal with grief down the road. And I remember we were going to a grief counselor, my wife Jerry and I, and we said, and I remember going in saying, well, I've done the research, and I know that 80%, I read that 80% of couples break up after the loss of a child. And I remember the grief counselor kind of smiling at me gently and saying, yeah, but you know, 50% of couples break up anyway. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about that. And I'm a professor, but not very smart. So anyway, I said, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, she said this, though. But if you start judging how your wife, Jerry, grieves, or if she judges how you grieve, you'll break up. You'll split up. That's a certainty. So I went to northern Michigan. Jerry stayed here and gardened and sculpted and did other things that she does. But when I went up to northern Michigan, I decided for me, you know, Jerry gardens and sculpts. I decided to drink myself to death and to eat myself to death and to sit and watch whatever Kim Kardashian was on, which is a true sign that you're ready to die. <laughs> so I'd ask myself, what is going on with me? And, you know, I knew I was dying. I really was just kind of dying. And I and so I, I kind of thought about myself almost as a boiling frog. Have you heard of this boiling frog metaphor before? I love this metaphor. It's so relevant to you, your patients, your loved ones. We all know boiling frogs. If you take a frog and dump it into boiling water, that frog's going to jump out right away. But if you put a frog in cool water and just gradually increase the heat over time, that frog will just get sleepy, the frog will roll over, and the frog will croak. So we deal with patients all the time 
who are boiling frogs. Chronic disease management is not, you know, you don't just start smoking and die right away. You don't just, like, instantly gain a lot of weight. You don't just instantly, you know, basically get these illnesses that ratchet up so much. They're gradual. They're boiling frog problems that we deal with all the time. United Healthcare, the president of United Healthcare recently told me they spent 86 cents on the dollar on chronic disease management, and 80% of it is related to our behaviors, to our boiling frog behaviors. So we need to teach our nurses, our doctors, our FNPs, everybody how to manage behaviors and behavior change and boiling frog problems, because a boiling frog is not noticing what's going on. You know, you gain a pound a year on average. They don't just instantly gain a ton of weight, not usually anyway. So, you know, 40 years after, you know, eating, you're 40 pounds heavier. That's, that's a boiling frog problem, for example. But let's try to help, you know, there are a lot of nurses in this room, a lot of clinicians in this room. Let's help this frog jump out of the water. So what might we tell this frog? What might we say to the frog? Just think about it. How are we going to get the boiling frog to jump? Make perfect sense to just say, you need to change, Right? It's really important, so give him a pamphlet. <laughs> my God, I never knew smoking was bad for me. Jeez, I've been alive for 60 years. Oh, my goodness. So you need to change. Now, then the frog might just go, what do you know? Are you an expert on boiling water? Have you been a smoker before? Have you been an alcoholic before? Have you been a depressed person before? Have you been anxious before? Have you done this before or that before? You get that all the time, right? With your loved ones, you try to change. Your patients, you try to change. Doesn't matter. You're trying to help other people. And often you get that defensive force field. Like, what do you know? Do you know about climate change? Are you an expert on this? So, you know, then you up the ante, don't you? You go, okay, this person isn't listening to me, so let's scare them, right? You're going to die if you stay in that water, frog, right? That would make sense, and we think we've done our job now. As a health professional, you're going to die. And then they might go, well, wait a second, this water isn't so hot. They might deny the fact that the water's even hot. Now go away, I'm just kind of getting sleepy. So that was me out on Lake Michigan, two miles out, deciding whether I would paddle 88 miles to Wisconsin, which, of course, that wouldn't have happened, or to change my life. I also want to tell you that I made myself in this graphic novel image look thinner and more handsome than I really am. <laughs> it's my book. If you write a book, make yourself look thinner and more handsome. I don't care. But the, you know, the illustrator said, it's your book, dude, whatever. I said, but I want you to make my daughter look exactly the way she did. So that's, that's Julia. So when I came back to shore, because I decided to live, but I also realized I had to change my life, I was like this. I had this exploded brain, not knowing what to do, but I started asking myself, wow, you're a behavioral scientist. What should you do to you? You're used to helping other people. You're kind of confident that you can help other people. Help yourself now for a change. So what am I going to do? And I had to think about it. And I was still in boxers and t-shirt. I know that's too much information, but just let you know, I mean, it was like, spring, it was cold, and I sat down at the kitchen table and I wrote down the things that mattered most to me, including love, beauty, my daughter, my wife Jerry, the world, my parents, and my students. And from that, I started assembling a draft of what is now my purpose in life. By the way, purposes change a lot, but I started assembling a set of goals around these things that mattered most in my life. And it starts this way. My purpose in life is to enjoy love and beauty. That's my personal hedonic purpose. To be an engaged son, husband, and father. That is my family purpose. To teach every student as if they're my own daughter, Julia. And to study purpose in life and related concepts. That's my work purpose. And then finally, to help over one billion people, I know that's a lot, but help one billion people find greater purpose and meaning in their lives. Our world, by the way, if you haven't noticed, is becoming less purposeful. A Gallup poll, which has been conducted yearly for the last 10 years, has found in their purpose question, they have a purpose index, found that it's lowest in its history right now. It's going down, 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 down further. I'll get to that in a second. I also started doing research on purpose, as I showed here, because I realized, wow, this idea of repurposing my life now, I need a new direction in my life to do that, to teach every student as if they're my own daughter, that seems energizing to me suddenly. So let's take a look. Let's look at the research on purpose. 
And I'm just going to zip through this quickly. It turns out that people with a strong purpose are more resilient. Soldiers who come back from the Gulf War who cannot repurpose their life are, far, are very likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. You've heard that a lot in the media. Soldiers who are able to repurpose their life are more likely than not to develop post-traumatic growth. That's something we don't talk about so much in the media, but it's absolutely true. If you can repurpose yourself after an earthquake, a tsunami, a war, a loss of a loved one, cancer, many, many other issues, if you can repurpose your life and develop that purpose, you're more likely to develop post-traumatic growth. You grow from that. The Buddha talked about how suffering helps us create growth. I won't go through all of these, but you see that people with a strong purpose live longer. They sleep better. They're able to make behavior changes in their life much more. Why? Because they have a purpose. And they go, well, I better take care of myself because I have a big purpose in my life. Not because necessarily they want to live longer. They just do live longer. And they turn out to be very happy, too, as a result. They even have better sex. I mean, that, there was a study of middle-aged women found... People with a stronger purpose have better sex. That's wonderful. Not more sex, unfortunately. But better sex. That's great. So people with a strong purpose have less conflict in their mind. They know what to do. They're less scared. I'll get to that in a second. They have less pro-inflammatory cell production. You know what that does. They're less likely to develop depression. Ten years down the road, people with a strong purpose, and this is all these studies... Most of them are controlling for the kitchen sink, statistically. So these long, longitudinal cohort studies, they follow people just the way you might follow smokers or follow people with a good a Mediterranean diet or other things. They follow people with a good purpose versus a low purpose, and they find that those people, after controlling for age and race and gender and income and education and health status and health behaviors at time one, they still end up doing much, much better. They live on average of seven years longer. They make more money over time. Controlling for net income and net worth at time one. Why? Why do you think? Probably because people with a strong purpose think further out in the future than people with a weak purpose who think kind of on automatic, more hedonically. Make sense? So if we had a pill for this, can you imagine the, that pill? It'd be a multi, multi, multi billion dollar drug. Everybody would want this pill does all of these things. Let's look at people who I care deeply about, college students. All of you college students. Ten years ago, 8% reported major depression. This is from the Healthy Minds Survey. And the Healthy Minds Survey has looked at over 180 universities and over 200,000 college students over the last 15 years. Ten years ago, 8% were depressed. Now 18% are depressed. Question about, have you thought about ending your life in the last 12 months? Ten years ago, 7% of college students had thought about that. In the last 12 months. Now it's almost double that. That's very sad. Ask yourself this question. I won't ask for a show of hands, but ask yourself. On a scale of 1 to 7, where 1 is I don't lead any purposeful or meaningful life, to 7, I lead a super awesome, purposeful, meaningful life, where are you? Are you a one to four? Let's put that in the red zone. That's about a third of people. Are you in the yellow zone? That's five to six. That's about a third of people. Are you in the green zone? That's the sevens. I lead this awesome life. Now let's look at what kind of people those are. Let's look at depression. 11% of people in the green zone in terms of purpose, strong purpose, have significant depression. These are college students again. 33%, three times as many, have depression if they're in the red zone. One to four, pretty generous. Suicidal ideation, 4% in the green zone, 29% in the red zone. Let's take a look at this Healthy Mind survey by the field of study. Is that relevant to you nursing students? Let's start with, and this is a one to seven scale. I just contracted it from 4.5 to six. Let's look at the group that has the lowest purpose, that is art and design students. This is throughout the country, not necessarily U of M. In fact, art and design here at U of M spends a lot of time on this issue, on purpose. Then let's look at humanities. Let's look at natural sciences. Let's look at engineering. How about business? Business people have a purpose too. How about education? 
Where's nursing? Oh, it's at the top. Nurses have the highest purpose of any field of study in the United States. Well done. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Can we get a little applause for you guys? Pretty amazing what you guys do. Now, how about what happens when we decide to retire? Marge and I chatted about that a little bit. I said, I thought I, you retired in 2017. She said, yeah, for eight months. I said, oh, really? What are you doing now? I'm working in nursing school full time. What happens when people retire? A lot of people retire and go, I can't wait to retire because now I'm going to golf all the time. And then five days later, they realize they suck at golf. They've just played for just five days, and their bones are achy and sore, and they stink. And they say, ah, oh, I'll just watch the Golf Channel. And then they watch that, and they eat Doritos, and they get larger, and then they eat, watch ESPN, and they get larger, and they keep eating more Doritos, and then suddenly, you know, they get diabetes, and then they're continuing to watch TV, eating more Doritos, and then their legs are gone, and then they swell up and die. So anyway, this is not good, right? You need to do something. You need a purpose when you retire. It's incredibly important. It turns out there are now three studies of this, of people at retirement who retire with a strong transcending purpose, controlling for uh, cognitive impairment at baseline, controlling for all these other things we've been talking about. If you have a strong purpose, you are 2.4 times less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. We know of no other behavioral, and I'm calling purpose a behavior. It's something you can engage in being purposeful. We know nothing even within one-fifth of that that you could do to possibly prevent Alzheimer's. Physical activity, one-fifth. The Rush Alzheimer's Center in Chicago did this study. I called B Patricia Boyle, who ran it, said, man, this just swamps everything else. So could you build a purpose pill? Could you help people find more purpose? That makes sense? So let's look at a study that did that. Let's start with identical twins. Let's look at these identical twins. By the way, it's not just one set of identical twins. This is a composite of 10 identical twins. And they're in their 60s and 70s. Now, nurses were asked to judge these identical twins for their age. OK, I'll ask you nurses, who, which composite looks younger, the left or the right composite? The left, of course. That's right. They look, in fact, nurses judge them to be 64 years old on the left. And by the way, they're born with the same DNA, right? They look exactly the same when they're babies. And then suddenly, stuff happens to them. Chaos happens differently to different people, even identical twins, right? So they start looking differently. And people on the right, nurses perceive them to be 74, 10 years older. What's the difference between these two composite twins? One of the biggest differences is in their telomeres. What are telomeres? Telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes. Imagine like our shoelaces. We have these plastic caps at the end of our shoelaces, right? What are those called? What? Anyone? Well done, nice, aglets. You said it from the very back, nice job, okay. Some people know what the you know, ends of our shoelaces are. So that plastic cap, we know if they crack or get shorter, we need to go to the store and get new shoelaces, right? If our telomeres get shorter, we know that we need to go to the store and get a new life because we cannot replace our DNA. Really hard to do. So, but maybe we can lengthen our telomeres again. And Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the 2009 Nobel Prize in medicine for discovering the role, this is Elizabeth on the left, got together. First of all, she did a lot of research on stress and telomeres. And she found that people with a lot of stress, she started with moms who had chronically ill children, actually. Moms with chronically ill children had much shorter telomeres, an average of seven years, she estimated, than moms who have kids who are not chronically ill. Wow, stress. And since then, many studies have been done looking at this, and sure enough, finding that telomeres shorten with stress. So she got together with Alyssa Eppel on the right there, who's actually working with us now at Kumanu, this company that I created. And Alyssa's at, both of them are at UC San Francisco, and Alyssa's one of the world's stress experts. And Elizabeth said, Alyssa, how can we manage stress and then tell whether we can increase telomerase, this enzyme that fuels our telomeres, lengthens them? She said, I'll tell you what, let's move your lab over to a mountainside in Aspen, Colorado, which they did for three months. And they put people into a three-month loving-kindness meditation program. Anyone know what loving-kindness meditation is? It's such a beautiful meditation. There are over 200 meditations. But this is one of my favorites. It's where you basically 
breathe yourself into a nice meditative state, you start thinking about this beautiful place and you put a person in there, first of all, who you love, then a little after that, a person who's a stranger, and after that, a person who you really actively dislike. This could be a politician, it could be, a, I don't have anyone in mind, um, <laughs> but it could be a, uh, it could be, you know, a, a relative, it could be, you know, somebody, who knows, it could be a coworker. But what you do is say, may you be happy and may you be free of suffering. And you wish that person, even the person you don't like, happiness and freedom from suffering. And they were doing this for three months. And there's a waitlist control group. Guess what? A lot of people were, wanted to get into this study, duh. So they had a big, long waitlist control group. It was nice. And they, that was a control condition. And compared to the control condition, sure enough, the people in the meditation program had more telomerase, the enzyme that fuels our telomeres, by a lot. It was a very, very big effect. But here's what they also found. They asked people whether they had a purpose in their life. They looked at a standard scale of purpose in life, and they found, sure enough, the meditators were building a great, greater purpose in life. And when they put purpose in life into the statistical model, the meditation went away. What is that saying? What that's suggesting is that this meditation increased purpose, and it was the purpose improvement that actually improved our DNA, repaired our DNA. Is that making sense? That's a pretty cool study. We need more studies like that. We're still in the infancy of this kind of research, but pretty amazing. And one might guess, though we don't know, that the group on the left has a stronger purpose. So let's get back to our frog for a second. Our boiling frog. Man, it would sure be nice to learn about what would get this frog to jump, what's going on. So we could open its brain up. We could basically dissect the frog, but it would upset the frog a lot. So instead, let's take humans and clamp, clamp their heads down in an MRI machine and like show them pictures, show them images, and have a little joystick on each hand so that they could rate different things that we're sending them. And let's focus on two areas of the brain. One is called the amygdala. We're probably familiar with this. It's a very reptilian part of our brain. So, you know, Gazzaniga, who wrote the classic book on neuroscience, said that our brain stem is kind of like an ice cream cone, and the first scoop on it is this ancient reptilian part of our brain. It's literally hundreds of millions of years old. Dinosaurs had amygdala. And this is our fear and aggression center, OK? Super, super basic. We still need it, though, because if we're backpacking and we see a rattlesnake, we'll jump back, even before we say, oh, that's a rattlesnake. And that's important, or we wouldn't be here in this auditorium. So it's important to have that amygdala. But also, we need this ventral medial prefrontal cortex. This ventral medial prefrontal cortex part of the prefrontal cortex is super modern. It's the most modern part of our brain. And it's super human. Humans have more in proportion of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, what I like to call the guru part of the brain, because it thinks long term. So the VMPFC, or ventral medial prefrontal cortex, is the part of the brain that starts thinking about long term issues, which is really important in health, isn't it? It's really important in wealth as well. It's really important in happiness as well. You think long term as opposed to the immediate hedonic kind of purpose. Very important. So we show people, when we put people in, I'm lucky, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I am so grateful to be associated with some amazing neuroscientists, both in my lab originally and now they're in different parts of the country. So what we do is put people into MRI and we show them pictures like this. And this is the nicest picture that we show them, by the way. We show really, really hideous pictures, and they're designed with a purpose. They're designed to imp increase blood flow to the amygdala. And sure enough, that happens. One thing we find then, when you increase blood flow to the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex gets less blood flow. This is really an important factor here. Just think about this for a second. When we are scared, we stop thinking. Imagine what a politician could do with that. Scare the crap out of, oh, terrorists. Oh, people coming over the wall. Oh, this is happening. Oh, that's happening. We can scare people a lot. And by the way, this happens both on the right and left. I don't have to get political about this. This is about every politician knows that they can scare the crap out of you. You stop thinking, and it's easy enough then to vote for them, right? That happens all the time. But it's also important to know that when you're scaring a person, going, frog, you'll die, that this is what's happening. They're getting less blood flow to the thinking part of their brain. They're just reacting to you. So now what happens to a resilient person? This isn't everybody. 
resilient people within a matter of two to three seconds suddenly get more blood flow to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex while the amygdala shrinks. Modern neuroscience is not just about the phrenology type of approach of saying, oh, this part of the brain does this, this part of the brain does this. No, what's more interesting now is the interaction between different parts of the brain, the dynamism of the brain. And this is something that we're finding. So it's very important to figure out how can we get more blood flow regularly and get that bounce. What I like to call the Brady bounce, like Tom Brady, you know, the quarterback, and you know, his head is smashed into the turf, and he gets up and goes, oh my God, where am I? He goes, oh wait, what was that defense again? That's a bounce to the prefrontal cortex, right? But that's what we want. This is really a neural signature of resilience. We making sense so far? Okay, good. Um, so we've done a study with uh, my colleague, Emily Falk, who's amazing. She was in my lab, and now she's at Penn with an amazing giant lab. And we put people, over 200 people, who are sedentary, very, very couch potato-ish, into MRI. And we wanted to monitor them after they're self-affirming their core purpose in their life, or not. We randomized them. And we also wanted to find out, thinking that more blood flow will go into the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the guru brain. Then we wanted to threaten them. We wanted to say, you need to work out. Get off the couch, you know? And basically saying, frog, you're going to die if you don't jump. And then we gave them a smartphone. And the smartphone, every day, would have a message about their why about their purpose, affirming, reaffirming their core purpose in their life. And at the same time, we gave them instructions on how to work out more. Okay? And then we'd follow them for 30 days with an accelerometer. So basically a fuel band, Fitbit, those sort of things. So we can monitor steps objectively. So here's the study. We randomized people. Half of them, we had them self-affirm their core values, their purpose, while they're in MRI. Imagine that, clanking along, and you're going, yeah, think about that core value, that purpose. And then we go, you really need to work out more, buddy. And then when they get out, we go, here's a smartphone, and the smartphone has your purpose every day, reminding you of why you're doing this. And then at the same time, here's how to do it. Notice that we're doing the why and the how at the same time. And then the other group, we just gave them the how, no why. We just had them think about their daily routine, no self-affirmation, but we threatened them. We said, you need to work out more, and then we gave them a smartphone, and it just said, here's how. But we didn't say why. We didn't give them that. We didn't recite their tailored purpose for them. Making sense so far? Followed them for 30 days, and sure enough, the first thing we wanted to do is a manipulation test. So we wanted to find out when you do that, that self-affirmation does more blood flow indeed go into this VMPFC, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And sure enough, we found that. So that green is the VMPFC. Sure enough, the affirmed group had much more. So we're going, bingo, that's good. Now let's see what happens in the affirmed group in terms of accelerometry. Do they reduce their sedentary behavior if you've been thinking about your purpose? What do you think? That's what we found, exactly. That green line is the affirm group. They reduced their sedentary behavior by a lot over 30 days, measured by accelerometry. We didn't just ask them. And by the way, the more blood flow that went into this part of the brain, the more they reduced their sedentary behavior. So we're starting now to just get a handle on this idea of purpose and what's going on in the brain. Making sense? We good? Any questions so far? Maybe 15 more minutes. Good. All right. So here's another thing Aristotle said. He said there are two different kinds of purposes. One, and I'll, this is described by Barbara Fredrickson, a really wonderful researcher at the University of North Carolina. She said, one purpose is a hedonic form, representing the sum of an individual's positive affective experiences. And then there is a deeper eudaimonic form that results from striving toward meaning and a noble purpose beyond simple self-gratification. Aristotle basically said that we all have a hedonic purpose. We all love good food or good wine or good sex or good things like that, a nice car or whatever. But if that's all we love, then, and I'm using Aristotle's words, he said, then we are grazing animals. If that's all we have. We need something that's bigger than that. And he called it eudaimonia. So what does eudaimonia or eudaimonic mean? We know what hedonic means, right? What does eudaimonic mean? Well, let's go to the root word, daemon. Daemon is Greek for true self or godlike self, being in touch with that true self, that godlike self. And the Greeks 
thought that you were born with that, and it was inside you, and you just had to get in touch with it. By the way, Hindus call it the Atman, and they believe that it is inside of you. In fact, they have this little mark here. You see Hindus with a little mark here, and that is, by the way, right where the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is. That's called the third eye, and that's where the Atman is. Pretty amazing. They've known this for, what, 3,000 years? Weird. Isn't this, this is amazing to me. So, go back to Socrates. Socrates, this street philosopher, is asked by Plato a question he can't answer. He says, I'm going back into the alley, and I'll tell you in about 15 minutes. I'm consulting my daemon. Really? He's consulting his true self. In fact, he was so smart when he came back out of the alley that they would tease and say, wow, you know what? You're like these Greek terracotta sculptors that of the Greek gods, and if you tap them, the Greek sculptors would like to put in this little golden figurine inside. And that golden figurine was called the daemon. They said, you're like that golden figurine. You're awesome. So, Barbara Fredrickson did this study looking at people who were eudaimonically happy and people who were hedonically happy. Both were equally happy, but here's what they're like physiologically. She found that the hedonically happy people, purposeful people, had more pro-inflammatory cell production. That's not good. Than the eudaimonically. And then the eudaimonically well people had more antibody production, which is really good. In other words, Phenotypically, they're both happy. You can't tell the difference in a survey. Physiologically, they're 180 degrees different. Is that making sense? That is freaky to me. There are now three studies that have shown that. We then went back and said, okay, this eudaimonia, what does that mean? Really, we might call it self-transcending purpose. Something where you're thinking about a purpose bigger than yourself. Does that make sense? So we're thinking about purpose is not about just ourselves and good food and good wine and good sex. We're in good cars. We're thinking about something bigger than ourselves. And we call that self-transcendence. And we're not always self-transcending people, but we are, that's one thing that we could strive to be. So we wanted to find out what happens in the brain when you're self-transcending. So we asked people to just think about their most self-transcending values. Sure enough, we found less blood flow. The more transcending you become, the less blood flow goes into the amygdala, nice. And the more blood flow, in a separate study we found, the more blood flow goes into the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So let's think about this self-transcending purpose. You may be thinking about your own purpose right now. How do I find a purpose? Do I have to go and meditate in a cave in India for six months? So let's start with goals around what matters most. Let's think about what matters most in our lives. I want you to just take a breath right now. And I'd like you to think about the things that matter most at work in your life. Rachel Raymond, who's a physician at UC San Francisco, said this wonderful thing. Often finding meaning is not about doing things differently. It's about seeing familiar things in new ways. So what if you were to think about the people that you're with, the patients that you're with? What is most important to you at work? Kind of like the what's on your smartphone. This is my granddaughter. So I'm going to ask you guys to pull out your phone again, if you don't mind. And you don't have to put in the, the address anymore, the 37607. You can just um, put in a word. Try putting in a word. Oh, wow, nice, fast. Let's see what people say. What, mode, ma- what word describes what matters most to you in your work? Wow. By the way, this is, this is who you are. This is your identity. Helping. Wow. Safety. Communication. Purpose. Nice. Relationships. Touching. That's, that's really cool. Compliance. Yep. Love. Wow. See, helping, a lot of people put that. Patience, relationships, compassion. I couldn't be speaking to a better audience, honestly. Wow. Okay, let me move forward. 
Let me move forward to the organizational side because Marge was really interested in organizations and organizational purpose is one of the most important things we could have. One of the people who study this more than anyone is Raj Sisodia. He's a business school professor and he and a group of other business school professors developed a study called the Firms of Endearment. This is such a cool study. And in the Firms of Endearment, this is what he says, conscious businesses are galvanized by higher purposes that serve, align, and integrate the interests of all their major stakeholders. He said that firms of endearment, these firms think not just about revenue, but they actually transcend revenue in thinking about their customers. They think about the product, they think about their communities. And so what they did about 20 years ago is identify 28 companies, public and private, that he felt and his team felt had revenue transcending purpose. Said they're in it for more than just the revenue. They think the revenue come, but that's secondary to having this bigger purpose around their customers, around their employees, around their product, and their communities. So you can read some of these, and you may even disagree with some of them, and that's fine because things change. But let's take a look at those firms of endearment, because this is what they did in their firms of endearment study. They wanted to compare them against good to great companies. Jim Collins wrote a famous book called Good to Great. Any B school student reads this as, as par for the course. And they wanted to compare good to great companies, by the way, are companies that are based on their financial prowess and their leadership prowess. And it's wonderful stuff. Um, but I'll just give you an example. Philip Morris is a good to great company. I don't know if Philip Morris would have made it into the firms of endearment. Make sense? So there are some fundamental differences between these. And then he compared them against the S&P 500. Here's what happened. In the first three years, the good to great companies, which are in that little top dot, were kicking butt. Jim Collins was right at that time. Three years later, Jim Collins was saying, yep, absolutely, my, firm, my, my uh, good to great companies are kicking butt over firms of endearment and S&P 500. Then they coalesced at five years. Then at 10 years, suddenly the firms of endearment started doing better. That's the green dot. You see, that's starting to pop up. Now, I need the whole y-axis here because after 15 years, you see that the firms of endearment increased their return on investment by 1,681%. 1,681% compared to the good to great companies, 263% compared to the S&P 500. Look at organizations that have this revenue transcending purpose, they do better. Look at humans who have a self-transcending purpose, they do better. When you stop thinking about yourself all the time, you start saying, wow, what is my bigger transcending purpose? Now, how about organizations? This is what most people are like in organizations. 70% are disengaged or actively disengaged. That is a study that was done by Gallup, and it continues to come out, and we just find that that's the case. Let's look at the U.S. workforce. Ari Weinzweig, who is one of the founders of Zingerman's, shared this study with me, and it's pretty amazing. This is a Harris poll that found 37% of U.S. workforce employees clearly know their company's purpose, 37%. 20% are enthusiastic about that purpose, one in five. One in five see how they could support the purpose. 15% feel enabled to work toward that purpose. And 20% fully trust the company that employs them. What if you're a football team and you had that attitude? So this, by the way, is Tom Brady. Yesterday, in the morning, I was giving a keynote address, literally in Gillette Stadium, Patriot Stadium, in... Foxborough, Massachusetts. And I said, you see this guy? He's famous for, you know, for being a University of Michigan quarterback, right? I go, he went to U of M? I didn't know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> idiots. So anyway, so what if Brady had this huddle and he had 11, you know, he's got 11 players on his team and four of them know which goal they're going to? Sorry, Tom. Two of them care. <laughs> Two of them know which position they're supposed to be playing. And two believe that their efforts could make any difference at all. And then eight would just as soon be rooting for the other team. <laughs> would that be acceptable? Of course not. We'd go, that's ridiculous. We're firing the coach. Well, why can't we have that type of team spirit when we're in an organization? Why can't we do that? And that's what Marge brought to this organization. That's what's so amazing. So to close, I'd like to, uh, you know, my purpose to teach every student as if they're my own daughter. And that's hard because I have 200 daughters now. So I have to sleep well. 
I try to work out. I try to walk to work every day. I try to um, meditate every day. In fact, I don't allow myself an alcoholic beverage at the end of the day until I've meditated. So I am the best meditator you've ever seen. (laughs) I meditate all the time. So it's really important. So I try to do those things. I also want to help over a billion people become more purposeful. So, um, you know, as the dean had mentioned, I have had a laboratory and then I created a company that was a digital health coach coaching company. Kumano is now, I would call a digital life coaching company, helping people become more purposeful, helping people apply their best self to the things that matter most. So the final poll I'd love to just get from you, if you don't mind. And can I have like five minutes? Is it okay? If I... Perfect, thank you. We started a little late. So I'd like to ask you guys, what word describes you when you're at your best at work? This is something that we really think about a lot at Kumano. What word describes you when you're at your best at work? Happy. I'm caring. I'm engaged. I love that. I'm gay. I'm passionate. Oh, man, I'm a good listener. Oh, these are so great. I'll share these with you guys, so we'll make sure you get them later. Wow, the, you guys are now engaged in this poll. I'm productive. I'm attentive, I'm content, I'm a player, nice. I know which goal I'm going to. I'm funny, oh, nice. People actually value humor, that's wonderful. (laughs) Nice, let's see some emojis. Come on, I want to see emojis. Oh, wow, this is great. Inspired, courageous, wonderful. Marge is create. Oh, nice, now we're seeing some emojis. I'm cool, I'm loving. I'm a thumbs up kind of person. I wear sunglasses at work. (laughs) Nice. Okay, digging it. Thank you so much for that. You can keep putting them in as long as you want. I'm just starting to close out. Um, So this is a company I created called Kimanu. And the only reason I'm showing this to you is that we're starting to pilot this at the cardiovascular center. So we're going to start this this semester, starting to pilot um, what we call purposeful. And this allows you to identify what do you like when you're at your best at work? What do you like when you're at your best at home? What's most important to you in your life? Put a photo of that. That's my wife, Jerry, on the right. That's our granddaughter, Madeline Julia, and that's our daughter, Rachel. So put that in because that's what's most important in my life. And then once you put that in, you can take a look and see a word cloud, just like we've been looking at. What does that word cloud make you feel like when you're seeing that, when it's active? It makes you feel like you're connected. You're connected to something bigger than yourself. That's what we're trying to do. And then finally, we're trying to help you find your purpose. So this is going to be put in very soon. So in this, we ask seven questions. What matters most to you? We've already been doing that. Who relies on you? That's a really super important question. Imagine an older person who has just lost even their cat. You know, suddenly they might become depressed because no one's relying on them anymore. Then they might start eating more or drinking more. And then they might start becoming a pre-diabetic or a diabetic, then suddenly it might cost United Health Group or Aetna or many, many other groups literally hundreds of thousands of dollars because that person lost their cat, because no one relies on them anymore. Go back to root cause. We don't think about that so much, do we? So who relies on you? Who inspires you? What causes do you care about? What are you grateful for? And then what gets you out of bed in the morning? Very importantly, very importantly, how do you want to be remembered? What do you want on your headstone? If you were to die today or tomorrow, remember we lived Julia's life as if every day might be her last. We started doing that, and the world became technicolor for us. It it became very important. And in fact, Steve Jobs, in 2005, told this whole group at Stanford, at the Stanford commencement address in 2005, he was dying of pancreatic cancer, by the way, and he said, death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. Can you imagine saying that to a group of 22-year-olds who have everything, the world in front of them? Stanford graduates, he's saying, by the way, think about your death more. It turns out that that's exactly what Buddhist monks think about every morning in their meditation. They think about death. It's exactly what Marcus Aurelius wrote about in his meditations. He was a Stoic philosopher. They would say, what if I died today? What do I feel good about that? I'd like to close with words from my daughter's uh, 
uh, letter, trying to, her statement, trying to get admitted into the School of Nursing. I literally went back yesterday, flying back from uh, Boston, and I started looking at some of her old letters. And she wrote this when she was 17, and she was trying to get in, as she was trying to get into the University of Michigan. Remember, she had gone through six heart attacks, cardiac arrests. This is what she wrote. Two hours, six cardiac arrests, and one do not resuscitate later. later. I squeezed my dad's hand five times to let him know I was alive. By the end of the week, I received my new heart. Some people find religion during such an experience. They might classify under miracle. I found purpose. Facing death at a young age gave me a perspective on life. It's different from my friends. My experiences have directed and motivated me to pursue the path that will help me carry out the purpose I feel for being on this earth. I'd like to close with a reading from the last page in my book. It's not a spoiler alert. I think you kind of guess because I'm here. It's called The Lake. In the summer evening, I settle into my kayak and paddle out onto Lake Michigan. Watching the sun melt into the calm water, I still feel Julia in me. She's in my loving kindness meditation. We look at the sunset together and smile, and I wish her peace and happiness. Lately, the family portion of my purpose, to be an engaged husband and father, has required an important revision I've added and grandfather with the birth of Madeline Julia, my daughter Rachel's new baby. That's one of the nice things about life, like family, like compassion, like understanding. Like a rubber band, it can be wonderfully elastic. The line in Lucretius's poem on the nature of things is as relevant now as it was 2,000 years ago. While some are ascendant, some recede, and generations are renewed again in a brief space, passing life's torch like relay runners in a race. Thanks to a numerical coincidence, my teaching career blesses me with a poignant gift. Every year I'm blessed with a new crop of students who are just the age that Julia reached at the end of her brief, big life. I enjoy watching each succeeding generation ascend with a commitment to finding purpose in their lives. Five years before, at this very place, I wasn't thinking and wasn't caring about myself or anyone else. Then I felt Julia telling me that if I was to survive, I'd need to get over myself and live for what matters most. I found a breeze at my back and a gentle current, and I know what harbor to make for. I have a lot to do before I die. And all of you do too. All of you students have a lot to do before you die. Everybody in this room has a lot to do before you die. And if you start thinking more about a transcending purpose and living every day with that transcending purpose, we'll have a better world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Strecker, for a very, very elegant and inspiring presentation. Um, I think I'm going to ask us to hold our questions um, because we do have some folks that need to move on. And there are a couple more things that we want to do before we end our time together. First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here, um, honoring many, many different people and many, many different ideas. I'd also like to ask all of you to join us for a light reception on next door in the upper level gathering. Um, we're sorry that those that are in our online and digital community aren't here to join us, but believe me, we will be thinking of you. And then finally, I'd like to invite Dr. Kalarko to join me on the stage so that we can all thank her for her leadership in inspiring this kind of incredible presentation for so many across Michigan nursing and Michigan medicine. Would you join me in a round of applause for Dr. Kalarko? Thank you.
you all. Thank you all.